I think that most of all, what unites people who are interested in science fiction is the fact that they are curious. They want to know what's possible, what's impossible, what could be possible. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and you're here at the Futures Podcast, live from the Science Museum, London, a temporary haven for science fiction enthusiasts. Tonight, we have the privilege of taking a collective voyage to the edge of author Pat Cadogan's imagination. Now, I warn you, it's not a journey for the faint-hearted. It's full of plenty of unexpected twists and turns, of contradictions and complications, of chaos and occasional coherence. Well, now, only occasional. Only occasional. Well, we'll see. Uh, now, suggesting that my guest belongs in a museum uh, hardly sounds complimentary. Uh, but her breadth and depth of her knowledge on the future, both real and fantasy, is boundless. Because long before our modern madness for the metaverse, science fiction author Pat Cadigan was exploring the immersive virtual reality that existed between her ears. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of royalty, a true monarch of the science fiction genre. Please put your hands together and welcome the queen of cyberpunk, my friend, Pat Cadigan. <laughs> Who could possibly live up to an introduction like that? I ask you. Well, actually, I, I, I will ask you. Can you all hear me over the dress? <laughs> okay, good, because it's my favorite loud dress. And the other ones that are louder are, well... I well, won't flick that on you. Well, for those just listening to the podcast, I can confirm it is a fabulously loud <laughs> dress. And uh, Pat, I want to open with the, the obvious question. We're, we're here at the Science Museum. They're, they're launching the science fiction exhibition. And what does it mean to actually do the act of science fictioning as a, as a thought experiment? Wow. Uh, that's quite a question because it's... it's how it, it's like asking me uh, what it's like to be me, you know. Uh, we all have, uh, I guess, a modality, maybe you'd call it, that uh, things that we do all the time. And it was really how I came to understand that, um, that I wanted to be a writer and that I wanted to be a science fiction writer. I wanted to write science fiction. And I tried all kinds of different things and then gradually, I found myself cutting off everything that interfered with my writing. And I, I didn't so much choose science fiction, it just seemed very natural to me. Because why wouldn't you think about what was going to happen tomorrow? You know, that seemed normal. And uh, I thought, well, while you're thinking of things that are going to happen tomorrow, how about the next day or next week or a thousand years from now? Or, you know, when you get to be like a thousand years in the future, you can pretty much, you know, get away with a lot. But, uh, but I decided to play chicken with the future and get as close to near, near future as I possibly could. And that was just a matter of observing and, uh, uh, you know, keeping in mind, uh, I, I, I don't know, in, in, in America, mothers will say things like, you know, if you make that face enough, it's gonna, you're going to freeze that way. I don't know if you, they, you, they say that here, but, you know, mothers are always predicting the future. You know, they're always telling you what's going to happen. And, you know, you should believe them, depending on the mother, but... Um, what was the question? Well, I, I, I love that idea of, of not 
playing chicken with the future. And to turn a phrase from, I think it's face off, but maybe someone correct, correct me afterwards. I think it's don't play chicken with the goddamn future. And I, I want to ask you about doing that process of, of looking into the future, because Pat, you are famous for the, oh Christ, what's next approach to science fiction. So when the future is often coming at you so quickly and so often, how do you stay ahead? Well, first of all, you have to you have to understand that deep down beneath the veneer of civilization, actually, all bets are off. Anything can happen to you. Not everything, but anything. And uh, and the thing that's going to happen to you is probably the one thing that you know you weren't. You weren't looking in that direction. I guarantee you'd be looking in some other direction. And uh, um, so you have to try and think of the things that you haven't thought of yet. That's not a very good answer, is it? That's not terribly. He, he did say intermittent coherence. So. <laughs> well, 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 let's look at the specific genre that you're known for, which is cyberpunk, because cyberpunk was very much about dystopian futures. And it feels in many ways today that we're, we're living in that cyberpunk future that you uh, imagine. So how much do you believe that cyberpunk has permeated our lived reality? Well, I, I don't think it's so much it's permeated. It's that, that cyberpunk has permeated. Um, the cyberpunk, the things that we identify now as cyberpunk uh, permeated reality. And it came on gradually. And w one of the things I like to tell people is that us cyberpunk authors, we never promised you flying cars and vacations on the moon and gold lame jumpsuits. We promised you a technological dystopia. How do you like it so far? Well, well, there we go. We're, we're, we're to some degree living in this this odd technological um, dystopia, and, and and I guess that goes back to something that you've claimed before that there's not as much science fiction in some of your work as there used to be because it's moving so fast. And how do you how do you deal with the fact that the future can move that quickly? And as soon as you've thought this idea, it it can bounce away into into the present or bounce forward into the present even. Well, when I was writing my first novel, Mind Players, I actually had to change something in galleys because something caught up with me. And it was the fact that they figured out how to alert people that they were dreaming in order for them to have a lucid dream without waking them up. And in my book, there was no way to do that. So I was going to look pretty stupid if anyone who knew anything about lucid dreaming, you know, read the book and they'd say, huh, well, she didn't do her homework. We hate that, you know. <laughs> so um, so I had to, you know, I had to tap dance real fast and uh, and fix it. And fortunately, there weren't a whole lot of plot points that that hinged on that. And I, I was lucky. I got away with that. But... Um, Mind Players is is farther in the future and more fanciful, and it's. I think it is obvious that it's written by a, by a very young science fiction writer because there are flying cars in it. The flying cars were a mistake, do you think? Well, um, I, I kept them for another novel that I set in the same universe, future, whatever you want to call it. I, I kept them just, you know, for sentimental reasons, because I didn't want to just go back and say, oh, no, the flying cars were a mistake. I figured, you know, well, they're there. I'll deal with them. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about those, those concepts or those characters, but how often do you think about the audience for science fiction? So a lot of the people here today have come because it is the science fiction late. And what do you think it is that unites an audience like this? Is it, uh, is it escapism? Is it uh, hope? Is it fear? Is it something else entirely? There have been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of things put forth on, on that and uh, a lot of people think it's the escapism, and uh, and I wondered about that. And then I remembered what Tolkien 
told C.S. Lewis about escapism because uh, people were writing his, Lewis's work off as mere escapism. And so he wrote to Tolkien and said, you know, it's like, how do I not have a nervous breakdown with this? And Tolkien said, well, think about the people who are against escape. Jailers. So if you see the world as one big jail, you want to pe keep people from escaping from it. But if you see it as a place where you're already out and you want to have lots of different kinds of adventures, and that's what, you know, that's what genre fiction is. I think that most of all, what unites people who are interested in science fiction is the fact that they are curious. They want to know what's possible, what's impossible, what could be possible, uh, and what, what, what's going to happen if it, if it comes to be. And uh, is it going to be something you know, expected, or is it going to have some kind of completely different you know, effect? And they'll read a story, and they'll see you know, how people are affected by a development science or you know, uh, something that happens because it's 10 years or 50 years later or whatever. And they'll be very curious to see what happens next. And, uh, and that was why I always read science fiction, because, man, I was glued to the page. I wanted to see how they were going to get out of this one, you know. Well it, well, it does feel, walking through the Science Museum during late, that we are surrounded by a marvelous amount of curious people. But you are certainly one of the most curious folks that I know. And, and one of the things you're desperately curious about is that weird relationship between human beings and technology. So where did that curiosity come from and, and where has it taken you? Um, well, here I am. <laughs> so the Science uh, Museum. Yeah, I'm here in the Science Museum. Uh, I, don't, I don't exactly know where it came from. You know, it's you, um, you, if you have any sort of curiosity, you are very likely to be intelligent because you're going to act on your curiosity. You're going to seek more answers or you're going to seek to know more about whatever kind of subject it is. And as long as you are not squashed by, you know, uh, insensitive parents and teachers or, or, or squashed by, by peer pressure of some kind, you are going to satisfy your curiosity. And um, that's, well, that's just, why wouldn't you, you know? Why, why wouldn't you want to, want to do that? And, uh, you know, I guess it's okay if somebody isn't curious, but I'm glad they're not around me. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be with curious, nosy, active, you know, people who, who can say what if. So there we go. You, you are both curious and intelligent. Pat, you really know how to play to a crowd. Um, one of the other things I really love about you is that in 1995, you abdicated from being a female science fiction author to just simply being a science fiction author. Uh, why was that such an important moment? And what did it mean for how people perceived and received your work? Well, <sighs> I was trying to make a point, and incidentally, I, I, I'm still a woman. <laughs> I, there, I'm, you know, I'm still, I decided to go with what I've got. But, you know, I, I think it's really great that if you don't want to go with what you got, you can't, you can, you know, do something about it. But uh, I decided, the thing was, at the time, I was getting some stick online People were online back in 1995, way back even then. Um, someone had said that female science fiction, female writers couldn't write science fiction. And, you know, someone says this several times a day, every day, and, and somewhere. But the way they had said it, they didn't just say female science fiction writers can't write science fiction. I've got that crazy, but... Um, he said that I was trying to crawl up William Gibson's, well, never mind. <laughs> and I just decided that I'd had enough of that. And so I posted and I said, 
excuse me, William Gibson's what? And uh, every so, I, I did that just because I thought it was good to remind people when they're posting that kind of garbage that actually they're not just scrawling it on their computer at home, they're doing it for who knows how many people. And maybe the person they're talking about is watching. So, um, and then a discussion ensued in, in which I didn't change his mind and he didn't change mine. I refused to say that I couldn't write science fiction. I think I'd already had won two Arthur C. Clarke Awards by then. So I was pretty hard to convince. But um, uh, I felt like people were making too much out of women versus men. And, uh, and even back in 1995, the field was not as diverse as it is now. And uh, since then, it has become, it has blossomed. It has become much more diverse. More different kinds of people are writing. Uh, I believe that this year's winner is the first book-length poem. And, uh, and I believe that uh, uh, the author is also the first trans woman to win an a Arthur C. Clarke Award. And I think that's pretty damn great. And uh, uh, not that I mean to, you know, call attention to a trans woman, or as I like to call them, women. Uh, but we see more, we see more openness and uh, more willingness to, to have an experience that is unfamiliar to our own. And uh, we don't do the same as yesterday, only different. And we don't have the same writers as before, only different. We have... Uh, we have quite an array of people, and, uh, and it really makes me happy to see that because I am curious, and if there's anything I want to read, it's something new, you know, and some, something written by someone who is not just like me. It was William Gibson's peripheral that uh, you were asked to, to disappear up. That's a good oh, William oh. Gibson joke. What, <laughs> what sort of science fiction fans are you? That was his last book, wasn't it? Peripheral. And it, I, I do have to ask, your personal relationship, Pat, with the future, that changed dramatically in 2014 <laughs> when you were somewhat falsely given a finite amount of future due to a cancer prognosis. So how has that changed sort of your mm. approach to how you deal with the subject matter? Well, first, I would like to, to point out that all of us go up, get up every morning and we go out with the idea in our heads that all evidence to the contrary, we are going to live forever. We cannot imagine being dead. Now, I proceed on the same basis, and I've been dead. Hmm. It's nothing. But um, when they, uh, okay, they told me that I had maybe two years to live, but they told me that in December 2014. So, um, and, and it's mainly because doctors will give you the, the worst case scenario because they don't want your survivors coming in and saying, you promised, we're going to sue you. Because even if they lose, the doctor still has to pay a lot in legal fees and that's a, you know, and then their malpractice insurance goes up anyway and it's just a big mess. And we think more about that in America, you know, it's like being here is like, <sighs> So, um, no, and uh, uh, Chris and I decided that, well, our first thought actually was when she said, it could be two years, it could be less. Um, my first thought was, she doesn't know me very well. We just met. And, uh, and so Chris and I decided that if we really did have, you know, just two years, then they would be like the best, most wonderful two years that we'd had together. And, uh, and then when we w if we got to the end of them and I was still here, we'd call that a bonus. I remember it was very difficult that year because I had to tell my son that, you know, 
what what did, what what the prognosis was. But then it was maybe eight months later. It became very obvious that I wasn't. I had a lot more than two years left, and uh, and which is why you know it's like no matter what they tell you about your health, you cannot. There is no way that you can will yourself out of disease, but you can will yourself into a better frame of mind, which will help you withstand not only the disease, but the treatment for it, which can be pretty hairy. And uh, um, just because someone tells you to lie down and die doesn't mean that you have to lie down and die. I mean, I don't know how many people have told me to drop dead over the years. It hasn't, hasn't worked, still hasn't worked. I'm just not very suggestible, I guess. So. Well, let's talk about suggestibility for a second, because you, you hinted there that uh, you imagine the dystopian that we're, or the dystopia that we're currently uh, living in. Do you think science fiction authors need to be extremely careful with self-fulfilling prophecy? I mean, in other words, how responsible are you and, and other science fiction authors for our perplexing present? Well, um, hey. Not guilty, man. <laughs> Not guilty. Uh, you know the. You kind of, you kind of, you kind of get what you're looking at. You know, in your in your music, in your literature, in your movies, in your art, whatever it is, you're going to see it reflected, and um, it's going. It, I don't. I don't would never call anything in science fiction a self-fulfilling prophecy because if we had that much power, first thing we'd do is we'd get better advances on those books. They would pay us more, you know, uh, if, we could, if we could actually have that kind of power. But, um, uh, but we don't. And uh, all we can do is... Science fiction is about the present... Sort of, you know, it, it, everyone would say, well, it's not about the future, it's about the present. But when I was writing Sinners, I really was thinking about what the future could look like. And I wasn't commenting on the present so much as commenting on where we would be if we continued into the future with the mindset that we had at present. And I think that's you know, that's basically what it is uh, with with writers who want to play chicken with the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have one final question, because if there's anybody in the audience who's thinking of writing a science fiction so story or a novel, or, or maybe even has a poem, a science fiction poem in them, what advice would you give? Oh, God, you know, it's like, <laughs> do it. Absolutely do it, because uh, there's, there's always room for another voice. And, uh, and what you have to do is you have to keep it to yourself. You know, it's like, don't talk about it, write it. And you have to put in, you have to put in the time, you have to put in the sweat, and you have to put in the angst and, and, and editing yourself, and then, but finish it. You know, get a finished thing, whatever it is, a book or a story. We always started with, when I was coming up, we started with stories. And that was, that was how you did it. You, uh, you got your stories in the magazines, and then the book editors took notice. And eventually you were invited, might be invited to write a book or invited to submit a book. Um, these days, it's completely different. And I really can't give anyone much advice on you know how to a surefire way to to kickstart your your career into uh, into the stratosphere, but what you have to do is you have to finish things, and that can be very difficult because that means that you 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 have to write the hard parts, and that means thinking about things that you may not have considered at all. I, you know, I have found myself agonizing 
over gloves, you know, not in the past, but in the future, you know, it's like gloves and pockets and uh, uh, styles of clothes and, uh, and skin dye and animated tattoos. And, uh, you know, it's, when, when you get going, boy, you can really think about some things. But um, uh, you may find yourself, you know, actually having to work out how your character manages to walk in the rain. You know, at what kind of rain is it and where is it and where are they? What are they wearing? And, uh, and, and it's more important than you'd think. And you have to you have to do research on a lot of stuff that doesn't that doesn't necessarily appear in the story, but the substance is there, and it shows. Uh, the the best analogy that I can give you is um, I I was asked to write the the making of the mummy book, the one with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weiss, and so I I got it. I got I managed to wangle uh my way into where they were doing the special effects. And they were they were doing these space stations and they built the space stations on screen the way you would actually build a s space station. They started with a framework and then they thought about what to put on next and it was like they were building something for real. They were imagining it and that's how it was. And I said, wow, you, you actually, you, you commit to this. And they said, well, we tried it the other way and it doesn't look right. And all those things that you don't see actually combine to make something that you do see into something that you'll accept as real, at least for the, for the period of time that, that you're working on it or the period of time that a reader is reading it. So there's there you just have to learn to pull in, you know, pull in those those bits of of of, um, of research that you don't think are relevant and no one's going to know you 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 did it, but they're going to be able to tell if you didn't. Well, there we have it, science fiction, just go and do it and perhaps even use the Science Museum's exhibition to inspire some of your own works. And on that note, I want to thank you for joining us for Futures Podcast Live. If you like what you've heard, then you can download the Futures Podcast on all of your favorite podcasting apps or follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, live events, transcripts and show notes can be found at Futures futurespodcast.net. Pat's book, Fools and Sinners, are available from all good bookshops. And on that note, please put your hands together and join me in thanking Pat Cadigan for joining us today. <laughs>